स्मोकिंग इज इंजूरियस टू हेल्थ स्मोकिंग कॉजेज कैंसर धूम्रपान स्वास्थ्य के लिए हानिकारक है धूम्रपान कर्क रोग का कारण है Steady, steady, take control, steady. To us, it's master. How to say this human disaster? Ha! 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 That's right. Sir, you had asked us to log in for our class. <laughs> yes. Sir, where are you? We can see a lot of machines behind you. Well, I'm a little away. I'll tell you what, uh, let me give you a hint. I am in the neighborhood of where, where my very educated mother just sent us 9-5. Of course, my very educated etc, etc, etc are the 9 planets, right? Ah, uh, 9 pies. Neptune, Pluto. And Pluto is not deemed a planet anymore, so she sent him nothing actually. It stops at Neptune. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, us, nothing. Us is Uranus. My very educated mother just sent us nothing. Man, he's in outer space. Congratulations, indeed I am. And very, very close to the moon. Moon? Yes, the moon. I can almost touch it. There it is. Press reports are then true. You have built a time capsule. Well, my time vehicle, uh, not quite. Time space vehicle would be a better description, yes. Sir, can a time machine really happen? Well, you know, I haven't tested the time travel capabilities of uh, this fine vehicle yet, but you know, it does seem to be working in space. Tell me, what comes to your mind when you think of space? Uh, Mangalyan? Chandrayaan. And which organization comes to mind? ISRO. And who is the director of ISRO? I'll tell you. My good friend Dr. T.G.K. Murthy and his guru and my guru are the same. Murthy was the former outstanding scientist and director of ISRO. A science guru? Yeah. Let me see if I can get an answer to the time machine doubt. Just stay on the line, will you? Victor Tango, connect to Dr. Tango, Golf Kilo, Mike Murthy. Murthy, M-U-R-T-H-Y. Dr. Murthy, Namaste. Namaste. I, I'm sorry, I'm calling you after ages. <laughs> well, my students have a question for you. Uh, students, you may ask. Sir, I mean, can one really go back in time? You have evolution and evolution or coexisting. Going in time forward, going time in backward, it is happening. In the sense, a seed is there. In time, it becomes a plant, a big, huge bunny and tree. In time, the same huge bunny and tree 
it condenses the thing and goes back in time not forward in the first case it was forward from seed to the plant in the second case from the plant to the seed in time going back and becomes a seed so this imagination this intuition this pre-science going back into the time going back forward and all these things they are all intricately connected in nature it is happening my guru he was an intuitive scientist he could feel and understand a lot of things that a normal scientist would take years doing all kinds of uh, fiddly little experiments now, according to Einstein, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and rationalism a faithful servant. Einstein talked about intuitive science? Exactly, and great men realize it. Where was Newton when he realized gravity? Sir, <laughs> he was sitting under the apple tree. He realized and felt gravity. It led to the theory of gravitation. And that gives us an idea of the cosmos and the planetary systems. However, it could not solve the interrelatedness and interdependence of space, time, matter, and energy. Life is strange, sir. Yes, yeah, strange as it may sound, these are facts. Now watch this. An in-depth contemplative experience under a people tree at Kakrighat where awakening from an hour-long meditation, he remarked, I have just passed through one of the greatest moments of my life. Here, under this people tree, one of the greatest problems of my life is solved. I have found the oneness of macrocosm with the microcosm. In this microcosm, of the body, everything that is there in the macrocosm, I have seen. That the whole universe is an atom. The microcosm and the macrocosm are built on the same plan. So really too difficult. No, no, it's not difficult. You see it every day, but you don't realize it. Once, a raindrop fell into the sea. Once a raindrop fell into the sea. Where am I? What is this? I seem to be sinking. And the ocean laughed. The water drop began crying. The ocean asked, Why do you weep? The water drop says, I am losing myself. Am I dying? The ocean says, You aren't lost. Neither you are dying, my dear. When you merge yourself in me, you actually regain your real self. Infinite, boundless, fearless, your true self. Well, have you heard of Yojana and Nimesha? No sir. no, sir. Oh, dear. You ever heard the name Sayana, a 14th century Indian scholar? No, sir. Well, Sayana was also known as Sayanacharya. He was a, a, a Sanskrit scholar from the Vijayanagar Empire, that's right, of South India. Uh, near today's uh, Bellary. Sayana was the Prime Minister in the Vijayanagar court. He was also a Vedic scholar. He wrote many commentaries. They uh, thing that he said uh, in Sanskrit is Tatha cha smaryate yojananam sahasre dve dve shate dve cha yojane ekain nimisha ardhena kramamana which means you, O son, that uh, travels at the speed of 2202 yojanas in half a nimisha. When you convert that into modern units, miles per second or kilometers per second, it does turn out to be exactly the speed of light. Achha, wo, ek sao art. Huh. Oh, please tell them about 108, yes. How did the ancient Indians know that the sun and the moon are 108 
times their respective diameters from the Earth. Um, the evidence uh, that they knew this uh, is uh, from many different sources. One, it's in the very organization of the Vedic texts. Um, it's also a part of the ritual, the, the Vedic ritual. And then it's also expressed in the design of the temple. The uh, distance from the front gate to the Garbha Griha was taken as 54 units, which is one half of uh, uh, 108. And the perimeter of the temple was taken as 180 units, which is, of course, half the number of days of the year. And uh, this uh, 108 was also a part of the number of uh, beads in the, uh, in the Japa Mala, the number of uh, karanas or dance poses in Bharatanatyam, uh, Tirthasthans, and so on. Uh, so how might they have known it? Not very difficult at all. Um, all that you need to do is to uh, have uh, someone take a tall pole and move it 108 times its height away from you. Then uh, when you look at the tall pole, its size will be the same as that of the rising sun or the moon uh, in the horizon. And, um, and since um, the rishis were scientifically minded people, they were also always looking at patterns uh, in nature. Uh, somebody did this uh, experiment and they concluded uh, the sun and the moon are 108 times their diameter from the earth. And modern science has also shown that the diameter of the sun is approximately 108 times the diameter of the earth, which is an amazing coincidence. I mean, so it's unbelievable. Ah, it might be unbelievable, but this is not the end. This is the beginning. My guru with his Vedantic knowledge of the cosmos proclaimed the identity of energy and matter. It was a revolutionary concept, but no mathematical formulation was available at that time. Sir, I mean, your guru, was he a scientist? Or probably an astronomer who worked on cosmology? No, no, I'm afraid not. Not as you perceive a scientist to be. But he was, you know, a, a spiritual leader with, with unique knowledge of the cosmos. Now, my guru, late in the year 1895, wrote in a letter to an English friend. Mr. Nikolai Tesla, the famous Russian scientist, thinks he can demonstrate that force and matter can be reduced to potential energy. I am to go and see him next week to get the new mathematical demonstration. In that case, the Vedantic cosmology will be placed on an unshakable foundation. I am working a good deal now upon the cosmology of the Vedanta. I clearly see that perfect union in modern science and the elucidation of the one will be followed by the other. Professor Velamir Abramovich of Serbia said, Tesla believed that the universe is an integral organism, which consists of many parts, similar but differing in different vibration frequencies. You know, in the United States and Europe, my guru met many of the well-known scientists of that time. And on one occasion in Oakland uh, in 1900, he said, we have matter and force. The matter we do not know how. Disappears into force and force into matter. Therefore, there's something which is neither force nor matter. as these two may not disappear into each other. This is what we call uh, uh, the, the universal mind. Einstein himself has acknowledged the contribution of my guru. He said, there's one Kananda who predicted that energy and matter are interchangeable. Kananda? Yes, yes. Sir, but who is Kananda? Kananda? <laughs> Kananda. Who else but Swami Vivekananda? Yes, he was not just one of the greatest communicators. He was, 
He was a spiritual leader, a visionary, but an intuitive scientist too. Sir, you have never seen or met your guru, yet you say he has inspired you. Well, I have to confess. I must have read nearly every word he's written, explored every theory and philosophy that he has expounded, and I, I have contemplated at great length his thoughts and words. Now, when was the last time you picked up a book to read? Just for the joy of reading. I don't remember. You don't remember? <laughs> well, I suggest you should all read a little more, not just for the for the joy of reading, which is immense, but the wisdom you will find between the covers of a book can be limitless. Like this universe, it, it can make you think and question and, and above all, look, look inwards and introspect. Questioning was his way of learning. He challenged his guru constantly with a barrage of endless questions and stopped only when he was satisfied with the answer. His guru not just allowed, he encouraged Swamiji's inquiring nature. Now, to understand, you need to, you need to know the, the time, the period, and the family. Let me see if I can show you something. Uh, here, let me see now. Uh, Roll, Victor, Tango, 1800, Sierra, Alpha Hotel video, come on up on the screen with... The Calcutta of the early 1800s was a cauldron of stagnation and there was a yearning for change. Now, by the time Narendra was born in 1863, a shift had taken place. Stagnation was a thing of the past, and he came into his earth at the height of the Bengal Renaissance. Vivekananda's family, three generations of lawyers, was part of the elite, questioning the social and cultural mores of the time. I'll tell you a story. One day when Narendra's father was not at home, young Bile tried his hookah only to check if it had anything to do with religion. Narendranath Datta, affectionately known as Norin and Bile, questioned the world around him even as a child. Norin's father was an eminent lawyer who knew Persian very well. His mother was well educated too and could speak in English. And his grandmother authored Ganga Bhukti Tarongini, an important book of those times. Norin enjoyed the privileges of his class. He learned classical music and also practiced boxing. And he graduated from the Scottish Church College in Kolkata. Norin was a believer of science. He found it very difficult to accept Kali. Are he even challenged his guru? Challenged his guru? Yes. Yes, he did. A monk is a religious person. Isn't religion all about rituals and worship? Sir, country got divided because of religion. Unfortunate. But there it was done by politicians. And rituals? Swamiji said rituals are absolutely necessary for the world as it is now. Only we shall have to give people newer and fresh rituals. A party of thinkers must undertake to do this. Old rituals must be rejected. 
and new ones substituted. New rituals? Science-driven rituals that people will follow for their good, like wearing a mask. And uh, where is this religion? Ah, are bhaiya, what is religion? You need to read Swamiji. In less than 400 words, he mesmerized the audience in Chicago. Listen carefully to what he said. Roll Victor Tango Sierra Charlie. Swami Vivekananda spoke at the Parliament of Religion in Chicago. A street in his name speaks it all. He said, It fills my heart with joy unspeakable to rise in response to the warm and cordial welcome which you have given us. I am proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. We believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. I am proud to belong to a nation which has sheltered the persecuted and the refugees of all religions and all nations of the earth. I will quote to you, brethren, a few lines from a hymn which I remember to have repeated from my earliest boyhood, which is every day repeated by millions of human beings. As the different streams having their sources in different places all mingle their waters in the sea, so, O oh Lord, the different paths which men take through different tendencies various though they appear, crooked or straight, all lead to thee. All the water goes to the sea. How true! Swamiji said, no one form of religion will do for all. Each is a pearl on a string. We must be particular above all else to find individuality in each. No man is born to any religion. He has a religion in his own soul. Any system which seeks to destroy individuality is in the long run disastrous. Sir, a swabi? What courage? Hmm, well, his guru, Sri Ramakrishna, molded him, answered all his questions, satisfied him. The Thakur himself tried and tested different forms. He said, stand in front of a pond. Some see water, some call it jal, while others call it pani. Yet some call it aqua. It is all the same. Wait, I'll try and show you something more. Roll, Victor Tagore. Romeo, uh, uniform. Many years before he met Narendranath, there had arose in Sri Ramakrishna's heart a sudden desire to experience the various other faiths different people lived by. <laughs> Was there any difference between them and his own? But he was convinced that to fathom this at all, it had to be done not at the level of reasoning, but by feeling each faith in the same way as those who followed it did. In brief, by becoming them. He practiced the path of Tantra under Bhairavi Brahmani. Baba. 
अरे पाजी केवल बदमाशी मुझे छोड़कर चला जाना चाहता है अंडर ए मॉन्क कॉल जताधारी ही नेक्स्ट फॉलोड द पाथ ऑफ द भक्ति ऑफ लॉर्ड राम who his father khudiram had worshiped with the deepest emotional fervor jo ram dasarath ka beta wahi ram ghat ghat mein leta wahi ram jagat pasara wahi ram sabse nihara now under a wandering monk called totapuri he walked on the path of vedanta non dualism realization of the absolute the brahman the impersonal the path of knowledge tum uttam adhikari lagte ho kya aap vedant sadhana karoge की करब ना करब हमें तो कि सब जाने आदेश कर ले करो तो जाओ अपनी माँ से पूछाओ क्योंकि मैं यहां अधिक दिन नहीं रहूंगा इट वॉज तोतापुरी हू इनिशिएटेड श्री राम कृष्ण इन टू सन then under a muslim sufi saint he took to the path of islam and he did not stop here he then followed the path of jesus and during the latter he had a vision of jesus traveling on those different paths by direct experience shri ram krishna reached the conclusion that if lived sincerely and with true devotion all faiths led to the same goal realization of god making man free there was no difference not in the essence he said i have practiced all the disciplines i accept all paths now do you know where mayavati is no sir uttarakhand high on the himalayas from where you can see almost the whole himalayan range sir it must be really beautiful yes pristine nature clean all around it is here that swami ji established the advaita ashram a center where the young can learn to love nature and feel nature he wrote on the heights of the himalayas i have a place where i am determined nothing shall enter except pure truth there i want to work this idea the purpose is to train seekers of truth and to bring up children without fear without superstition they shall not hear about christs and buddhas and shivas and vishnus none of these they shall learn from the start to stand upon their own feet they should learn from their childhood that god is the spirit and should be worshiped in spirit and in truth that is the idea that is the ideal indeed yes yes think about him you too will overcome fear and that is real education ask never accept anything without getting a satisfactory answer so you're a scientist 
and you're looking for a guru who's not there anymore. He was a monk. You say he's an intuitive scientist, but he was a monk who was basically detached from today's reality. Are, bhai, where does it say that a guy who likes dressing up in orange can't be a scientist? Do you honestly believe a monk can't be a scientist? You're greatly mistaken. Now listen to my friend Ramesh Mashalkar. He is a famous scientist and this is what he has to say. Roll Victor Tango Roger Mike 89547. I think there is a mistake that we are making. I think when we look at Vivekananda, we should not be looking at, at him as a monk. You see, that's what the, he does simply because he has not been brought out to them in the manner that I basically talked about or the way I have sort of understood. So we need to get back to the fundamentals and we need to highlight people like Vivekananda in the context in which we should be defining him. Not as a monk, but as a, uh, a great philosopher, thinker, uh, visionary, uh, who actually uh, talked about India to the rest of the world uh, in a way nobody had talked about uh, before and talked about the fundamentals which are going to drive uh, India into the 21st century. Sir, all that you say, I find it very difficult to accept. I mean, not just Dr. Mashalkar, even presidents have been influenced by his communication skills. Listen to this president. Roll Alpha Papa Oscar 980756. More than a hundred years ago, America welcomed a son of India, Swami Vivekananda. And Swami Vivekananda helped bring Hinduism and yoga to our country. And he came to my hometown of Chicago. And there, at a great gathering of religious leaders, he spoke of his faith and the divinity in every soul and the purity of love. And he began his speech with a simple greeting. Sisters and brothers of America. Sisters first. See, in one stroke, he elevated the status of women. Marvelous. He was such a visionary. Now, what he said about education will stun you. Wait, let me see if I can retrieve something. Uh, somewhere in the archives, roll Victor Tango Gamma Tango 9631. Yes, here we are. We have not failed individually in capability. Our students are no worse than the students in Shanghai or in Stanford. But we do not know how to manage. We do not know how to manage a school. We do not know how to manage a, an academic institution. Swamiji talked about the excellence of every individual. He talked about how a person is to be built. He was talking about building a whole generation. And that's what we have failed to do. So, I mean, sir, was he a teacher? You still have any doubts? He was a frank and forthright speaker. He didn't mince words. Watch this. In 1897, he was in Madras. Talking about education, he remarked, Take your universities. Hmm. What have they done during the 50 years of their existence? They have not produced one original man. Absolutely. They are merely an examination body. Is that education that is slowly making man a machine? And what do you have to say about that? It is more blessed in my opinion, even to go wrong, impelled by one's free will and intelligence, than to be good as an automation. So we prefer automation. I mean, machines that help us. Yes, yes, but if you become a machine, that will be sad, don't you think? You rely on machines and books too much. Swamiji once asked, what is education? Is it book learning? No. Is it diverse knowledge? Not even that. The training by which the current thought and expression of will are brought under control and become fruitful, that is called education. He taught and learned himself. There's no end to learning. Yes, sir, but we need to mug up so much. 
The problem is you try to mug up and not understand and therefore you don't learn. When you understand, you fall in love with it and that's when learning begins. But with all this education, we still have problems. Poverty, food. It is because we put ourselves in a corner. You know what he said? He said, so long as the millions live in hunger and ignorance, I hold every man a traitor. Who, having been educated at their expense, pays not the least heed to them. I'll, I'll try and show you something more. Let's have a look. Uh, uh, roll Victor Tango Romeo Romeo Kilo 87456. Yes. Deep in the jungles around Rachi are settlements of the poor. The administration fear visiting these places without protection. It is here a bus goes daily. It has a cutout to Swamiji fixed to the front. That is the passport to safe travel. And there are schools where the poor students learn. That is the transformation Swamiji wanted. But only education can't buy your daily bread. No, but in learning are the answers. This is what he said. It is our responsibility as youth to make our nation great in the world. Let us try to live in the villages and try to empower them. It is our responsibility because we have got educated. You, you, watch this. He said, agriculture should not be like what our farmers are performing now. It should be based on agricultural science, as it is in America, and we should learn agriculture as a science. And because America has done this, it has developed in all aspects. Go around, see for yourself, feel it. Only then will you learn something. You don't even know your own country. You've got to see it, feel it and love it. Only then you'll know your country and yourself. I've been showing you a lot. Let me see if I can show you something more. See, he went out to see the country. He learned scriptures. He felt the soil under his feet. Till he came to the realization. Oh, let me just show you. He walked to the southern tip of the country where three oceans meet. The Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean and the Arabian Sea. The sea is shark infested. On Christmas Eve or on Christmas Day, he stood and looked at the two huge rocks. The sea was wild, but it was nothing for the fearless monk. He swam across and meditated. The present and future of the country appeared to him. He realized why India, from the pinnacle of glory, was going to the depth of degradation. He prayed, he thought, and he perceived a new India. He saw India as a potent force that will renew and restore its glory. He created a route to a greater India. Sir, wasn't he afraid of swimming and travelling through forests? <laughs> Watch this, this. This happened in Manaras. While Swamiji travelled, he began studying scriptures, visiting shrines and practicing austerities. Once he was in Varanasi, This same place. He was chased by monkeys. They shrieked and clutched at his feet. He began to run. Just then he met a stranger. The stranger told Swamiji to face the brutes. The monkey stopped and ran away. That is the lesson of life. Face the terrible. Face it boldly. So he reached Almora and listened to what happened there. 
उसके बाद जब हमारे गैर फादर ने शमशेरा जी जो थे उन्होंने देखा उनको वो दौड़ से भी गए वहाँ पर महाराज को उठाया और बोले कि महाराज आपको क्या तकलीफ़ है तो कह रहे कि मेरे को प्यास लगी है बहुत पानी की और यहाँ पर कहीं पानी मिला नहीं है मेरे को तो मैंने कहा नहीं मैं आपको पानी पिला सकता हूँ लेकिन मैं मुसलमान हूँ अगर आप मेरे हाथ का पानी पी सकते हैं तो मैं भी आपके लिए पाई जाऊँगा कह लेगा नहीं मेरे लिए सब बराबर है Now it was considered sacrilegious to eat from the hands of a person belonging to a different religion. At Almora, the young monk attracted Lala Badri Shah, a local businessman who became his friend. Shah offered him a place at his residence. The house is still there. Swami ji loved the hills. He often visited the Oakley House, now known as Nivedita House. Roman Roland, who received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1915, said, "Among its flotsam and jetsam, he was nothing but a nameless sannyasin with a saffron robe among a thousand others. But the fires of genius burned in his eyes." and he was a prince despite all disguise disguised prince yes king in his vision and disguise well that is another interesting aspect you've raised why disguise he was to complete his self imposed mission to learn he did not want to be distracted now let me try to locate his uh, porbandar part of his journey Between 1891 and 1892, Swami Ji stayed for about 11 months at the house of Sri Shankar Pandurang, the Diwan of the Porbandar State. The Raja was so concerned about this wandering monk that he selected his best coachman and strongman as his bodyguard. The Raja sealed authority. never seen by anyone before is here the swami would visit the kimeshwar madhav temple and often meditate there for hours he also visited other shrines he rode to the sea shore and looked at its vastness it was at porbandar that swami ji learned french and finished studying panini mahabhasya and helped Pandit Pandurang in translating Atharva Veda. I I I I forgot he often changed his name you know. He was sometimes Swami Vividhishananda, sometimes Swami Sachitananda and at Porbandar he was Swami Sachitananda just to hide his true identity. See he wanted to be alone in his quest for the truth. Let me take you to Mount Abu. Now when he reached Mount Abu He took shelter in a desolate cave. Swami ji lived here. This is the cave. Some sadhus still live here. One day, quite accidentally, an advocate, Faiz Ali Khan, saw him. Drawn to his personality, he introduced himself. Soon he was so charmed that he offered any help that Swami ji needed. Monsoon was fast approaching; the cave would get flooded. Swami ji asked if he could get a door for the cave. Faiz Ali requested Swami ji to come to his bungalow. Insistent that he was, Swami ji agreed. Then he said that he was a Muslim. Swami ji brushed him aside and stayed with him. Faiz Ali lived next to the house of Maharaj of Khetri where Munshi Jagmohan lived. The first meeting of Jagmohan Lal was a disaster for him. He was harshly reprimanded for asking Swami ji how he accepted living with a Muslim. Completely shattered, he realized the power of this monk. Deeply influenced He took Swami ji to Ajit Singh the Maharaj of Khetri 
It was 4th of June, 1891. This changed the course of history. Swamiji stayed at Khetri for about five months. Education was at the core of their discussions. They often rode out to the Ballavgarh fort across the hills. It was at Ballavgar that the Maharaj made a room for Swamiji that had a direct access to his room from the outside. Before his trip to Chicago, the Maharaj of Khetri gave him the name you all now know, Swami Vivekananda. How did he manage time? Time management. Yes, it's time management. Swamiji was a natural management guru. Natural management guru? Indeed, leadership, personality, strength, spirituality and value, all in one. Boxer, wrestler, singer, spirituality, values, sir. You see, the Ramakrishna mission Swamiji established 125 years ago is based on modern concepts of management. When we speak of Swamiji as the great innovator of management values, we must remember that during Swamiji's time, the science of management did not exist. So what is management? It is nothing but organized common sense. Sir, class 12. Then five years of engineering and two years of MBA. After that, no industry will give us work. What sort of a world is this, sir? <laughs> Jobs, indeed. Is that what you'll be looking for? You haven't set your sights very high, have you? Great men, truly great men have certain intuitive qualities. They, they can foresee things. And I can assure you that they're not looking at jobs as a career. You don't need a job. You need a vision in which you can see yourself standing on your own two feet. But we need to earn. Of course you need to earn and you will earn. Now how you choose to earn is far more important than what you earn. Now let me see if I can connect. Victor, Tango, Romeo, Kilo, Swamiji. Namaskar, Namaskar Maharaj, yes. I hope you have a minute. Can you enlighten us on what Swamiji thought of education and getting a job? He saw the need for uh, uh, awakening the, the spirit of entrepreneurship, the spirit of uh, adventure, uh, a Rajasic ambition among uh, in young India. Uh, you see, uh, once he scolded one of his American disciples that uh, when the disciples said, oh, I see India is very peaceful and Swamiji said, no, this is not the peace that I want. This is the peace of the grave. The India is colonized. Uh, people are starving. People are under superstition and illiteracy. This is not real peace. This is tamasic peace. Uh, from this, one must be aroused to rajas, to activity and dy dynamism. After that will come sattva, serenity, inwardness and true spirituality. So as a uh, so what he saw in the West was the spirit of entrepreneurship and the spirit that I will make my own destiny. And he saw a great scope uh, for India, for the products of India, for the genius of India. And one of the ways to awaken this Rajas was to put India in touch with the rest of the world. So that's why he wanted young Indians to come out of India, to travel the world, to engage in business to come out here and study and learn and uh, um, and trade. So that's what he said, that there, there are these wonderful products that India has got and which can find a ready market in the West. This will lead to um, development of entrepreneurship among Indians and the development of the economy and a widening of um, our horizons. To those who have got degrees and they are searching jobs, to them he is telling, Fire upon you, throw your degrees in Ganges. Don't you feel ashamed? 
going down to Saheb, uh, to Britishers, and say, Saheb, please give me a uh, job, give me job. So he was not in favor of jobs. So what he says, he suggests, he writes to uh, his people, come here to America, bring some gumcha from Hooghly, sari from Banaras, and some masalas. I will help you in selling it here. So it is easy to say, but who will buy a gamcha, a towel? Have you heard of B.B. Russell? No? Bangladesh is a small mate. Fashion designer B.B. Russell was the first one to buy a shop. The design is a small one, but the design is a small one. The design is a small one, but the design is a small one. I was a student life, 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 a media, a designer, a pop star, a student life. The first one is B.B. I was a student life, a student life, a student life. Yes, sir. Fashion guru from Bangladesh. And what does she use? The gamcha? See, you have to overcome shyness and shame. The moment you think of gamcha, you curl up your noses. <laughs> There's a hint right there. You can start a business, an export business, or anything that you find that excites you. Management without thinking does not succeed. You know, from America, Swamiji wrote that he has fallen in love. All began wondering who or what it can be. Connect Victor, Tango, November, Yankee, Romeo. Pranam Maharaj. You've been talking to students. My students want to know about what matters most in management. Will you please tell them the story of Swamiji falling in love? Please. Well, he was staying um, at the house of a devotee at that time. And one day he came home in, in a great good humor and he said, uh, today I've fallen in love. And the lady of the house in half amusement and curiosity, she asked, who is the lucky woman, Swamiji? And Swamiji laughed and said, no, it is not a woman. It is organization, madam. Um, so that was it. He fell in love with the idea of organization. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. See, you heard organization. It is management and Swamiji's guru instinctively knew the management that could control the mind. Psychology? Mm -hmm. Must be hypnotism. Nothing of the sort. It has to be trust, pure love and complete understanding. But sir, all this is good. But in the real world, what works is power and money. True, short-lived power though. Money will come if you are on the right path. And so many years ago, Swamiji said, adaptability is a mystery of health. Your AQ, adaptability quotient, must be high. You know, I think I will have to share another story with you. Now, you all know about the Tata Iron and Steel Factory and the Indian Institute of Science. Yes, sir, of course. Right now, Swamiji met Jamshedji Tata and on hearing that Jamshedji was going on a mission to bring the steel industry to the country, Swamiji cautioned him, watch this. Swamiji would have been a young man at that time on his way to Chicago to address the World Congress of Religions. It was on board that they must have had many conversations which would then really convince Jamshed Tata that the serving the cause of research and higher education in India was in fact most important as far as the country was concerned. In this sense, his meeting with Swami Vivekananda would have reinforced his ideas for creating an institution like this and would have also given him additional strengths to overcome the many difficulties that undoubtedly lay ahead. Swamiji told Mr. Tata, I would like to give you a small caution. Whatever amount you spend to get the process of making steel, simultaneously you should learn the metallurgical science of making steel. I would prefer you to start an institute, a laboratory, 
to do advanced research on the subject. Jamshedji Tata established a steel factory at Jamshedpur. Simultaneously, he donated one sixth of his property for establishing an institute of material research at Bangalore, the Indian Institute of Science, a dream implanted by Swamiji. A monk with iron and steel. It would be wrong to call him just a monk, you know. He was a visionary, a patriot and a reformer. His vision of education was, was different. What was it, sir? Mm, Swamiji's thoughts on education challenged the traditional and conventional. Wait, watch this. Roll Victor Tango Bravo Echo Papa. The Bengali of October 1898 wrote, quote, It is proposed to found an institution which shall be or correspond to the teaching university for India, its primary aim being to teach and not to examine. The Bengali of January 14, 1899 wrote, Lord Curzon, while fully sympathizing with Mr. Tata's scheme, appears to have certain serious misgivings. His Lordship is not sure whether there will be sufficient supply of students. Surely, it will not do to secure the services of highly paid professors to lecture a beggarly array of empty benches. Do you know who Jamshedji considered to head the Indian Institute of Science? You wouldn't know. On November 23, 1898, Mr. Jamshedji Tata wrote a letter to Swamiji recalling the whole gamut of discussion he had with the latter on this subject about five years ago. He wrote, Dear Swami Vivekananda, I trust you remember me as a fellow traveler on your voyage from Japan to Chicago. I very much recall at this moment your views on the growth of the ascetic spirit in India and the duty not of destroying but of diverting it into useful channels. I recall these ideas in connection with my scheme of Research Institute of Science for India of which you have doubtless heard or read. It seems to me that no better use can be made of the ascetic spirit than the establishment of monasteries or residential halls for men dominated by this spirit where they should live with ordinary decency and devote their lives to the cultivation of sciences, natural and humanistic. I am of the opinion that if such a crusade in favor of an asceticism of this kind were undertaken by a competent leader, it would greatly help asceticism, science and the good name of our common country. And I know not who would make a more fitting general of such a campaign than Vivekananda. Do you think you would care to apply yourself to this mission of galvanizing into life our ancient traditions in this respect. Perhaps you had better begin with a fiery pamphlet rousing our people in this matter. I should cheerfully defray all the expenses of the publication. With kind regards, I am, dear Swami, yours faithfully, Jamshedji N. Tata. There is an unsigned editorial in Prabhupada Bharata, which was presumably authored by Swamiji, in which the editorial expresses very strong support to the Tata scheme, endorses the Tata scheme, and in fact recommends it to the people of India. Sir, what assurance do I have that after I pass out, I'll get a job? 
there are so many highly qualified people without jobs, sir. Again, you are asking the same question. Why do you need a job? Why can't you be self-employed? Sir, it needs huge capital investment. Where is the money? You need to read and introspect. You know what Swamiji said? And I quote, Within you lies indomitable power. With thinking only I am nothing, I am nothing, you have become powerless. Why you alone? The whole race has become so. Go around the world once and you will find how vigorously the life current of other nations is flowing. And what are we doing? What are you doing? Even after learning so much, you go about the doors of others crying, Give me employment. Trampled under others' feet, doing slavery for others. Are you men anymore? You're not worth a pin's head in this fertile country with abundant water supply, where nature produces wealth and harvest a thousand times more than in others. You have no food for your stomach, no clothes to cover your body. In this country of abundance, the produce of which has been the cause of the spread of civilization in other countries, you are reduced to such straits. Your condition is even worse than that of a dog, and you glory in your Vedas and Vedanta. A, a nation that cannot provide for its simple food and clothing, which always depends on others for its subsistence, what is there for it to want about? Throw your religious observations overboard for the present, and first be prepared for the struggle for existence. People of foreign countries are turning out such golden results from the raw materials produced in your country. And you, like asses of burden, are only carrying their load. The people of foreign countries import Indian raw goods, manufacture various commodities by bringing their intelligence to bear upon them and become great. Whereas you have locked up your intelligence, thrown away your inherited wealth to others and roam about crying piteously for food. <sighs> All that's fine, sir. But what can we do? But sir, what did Swamiji get? Unless we get a reward, is it worth it? What did he get? This getting for I. This I is the root cause of problems. Wait, wait, wait. Listen to this. What impressed me? A two-line statements of Swami Vekananda. And very rarely spoken those words. So I want to repeat the youth what he said. He's a spiritual leader of great might and representing the whole India, a spiritual leader. What he says, I want to read to you what he says. He said, My name, Swami Vekananda, Swami Vekananda, he says, My name should not be made prominent. It is my ideas that I want to be realized. So very rarely, a human being, a leader, a people's leader, a spiritual leader will say, not my name, but my ideas that I want to be realized. So beautiful. Look around you. Have the power to see and think. You need to concentrate, arrive at an idea. The way you accept defeat without trying is not right. It's very wrong. Very, very wrong. You want to hear what Swamiji said? Here we go. The means are in your hands. You blindfold your eyes and say, I am blind and can see nothing. Tear off the folds from your eyes and you will see the whole world lighted by the rays of the midday sun. If you cannot procure money, Go to foreign countries, working your passage as a Laskar. Let me, let me find something for you. Here. Roll Victor Tango Sierra Victor Papa 65982. Swamiji said, All combined efforts in India sink under the weight of one iniquity. We have not yet developed strict business principles. Business is business in the highest sense and no friendship. Or as the Hindu proverb says, I shame should be there. One should keep the clearest account of everything in one's charge. 
and never never apply the funds intended for one thing to any other use whatsoever even if one starves the next moment this is business integrity next energy unfailing whatever you do let that be your worship for that time swami ji talking business ethics so the word ethics has vanished even from education no it has not vanished you're much too cynical for one so young we have closed our eyes we only learn what the british wanted us to learn are in belgaum there's a company that has followed swami ji's ideals and have thrived on business i know you will not believe it but well watch this swami vivekananda taught us to plan i always feel that if somebody can take a idea and try to live up to that idea one life is not enough so i picked up some of his ideas and started implementing them in my business swami has also said that uh, you must have the power to get angry or the strength to get angry but it's not necessary if you get angry similarly there's nothing wrong in making money lot of money as long as you make it honestly so he said he makes a lot of money if that is true then why do our better students go abroad not just for money for exchange of education too You're going too close. You're going too close. Ah! Oh, I'm so proud of Santa. Back off! <laughs> Hello. Why are you all silent? What's wrong? I see. <laughs> you see a different person. I'll explain to you. A little while ago, uh, this capsule went a bit too close to the sun, and the radiation and heat from the sun. burnt half my beard off i had to take the other half off myself <laughs> even i'm getting uh, it's taking a little time even for me to get used to it yes but i'm i'm sure you will so you've been up there so long have you gained something <laughs> have i gained something well what is gain to make money enjoy have profit <laughs> my dear gain profit enjoyment these are momentary illusions why sir isn't it good to be happy happy <laughs> what is happiness what is happiness without mental peace let me tell you a story india was still uh, under british rule about 130 years ago a uh, A young lady called Margaret Elizabeth Nobel lived in Ireland. Now, even as a child, Margaret Elizabeth was uh, was independent, had a mind of her own, and often dared to sneak out with her grandfather to distribute clandestine newspapers. She was obviously a a rebel at heart. she fell in love at the age of 21 and when she was uh, around your age the man was an engineer they were happy together and might have lived happily ever after but but misfortune has a way of interfering with happiness the man was struck down with uh, with tuberculosis and soon succumb to it Margaret was shocked but over a period of time got over her grief soon 
she was emotionally involved with another man. However, this time in her history, emotional happiness was, uh, was not in her stars. The man ditched her. She thought her life had no meaning. She had almost given up, but not quite. She was no ordinary lady. She ran a school of her own and was a trained teacher of exceptional gifts. Later, later she was one of a group of educationists who, who founded a literary circle which later came to be known as the Sesame Club, of which she became secretary. Where she met quite regularly with literary luminaries like, uh, like George Bernard Shaw, Thomas Huxley, Barry Yates, H.G. Wells, the man who wrote The Time Machine. Though completely successful in her own right, there was an element of restlessness about her. On a particular winter evening of 1895, she was persuaded to attend a lecture. She, for the first time, heard Swami Vivekananda. And then, what happened to her? She found a purpose in life. That's what happened. After which, she came to India and became, yes, Sister Nivedita, the dedicated. Wasn't she a freedom fighter? I guess, yes, in a way she was a freedom fighter. She, uh, she had a free mind and loved freedom. Freedom from the shackles of British rule. Freedom, uh, freedom of education. Freedom to, freedom to develop in the field of science, arts, culture, and freedom for women. Nothing comes free. She must have had a purpose. Of course she had a motive, but her motives were quite different from what you think. Not to gain, but to give. Give? Give what? Share knowledge, education, guidance, and to follow the religious path of Swamiji. Religion? What religion? Swami Vivekananda said, religion is to be realized, not only heard, it is not in learning some doctrine like a parrot, neither is it mere intellectual assent. That is nothing, but it must come into us. Let us understand this, and the more we understand it, the less we shall have of sectarianism in India. For it is only that man who has realized God and seen him who is religious. So you have to see God. Have you met him yet? <laughs> ah, yes. That's a tricky question. The same question Noren asked Thakur. In ancient religion, an atheist was someone who didn't believe in God. And in modern religion, those that don't believe in themselves are atheists. That means those who don't believe in themselves are atheists. And the faithful are the ones who believe in themselves. Well, actually, the value of the terms faithless and faithful is not on God. It is on self-confidence. No self-confidence, no honey. Why did Margaret come to India? Oh, it wasn't easy for her. In fact, Swamiji warned her. He wrote to her on 29 July 1897, Obstructions are many. This country's sorrow, truth, malpractices are of an unimaginable level. India cannot yet produce great women. She must borrow them from other nations. Your education, sincerity, purity make you just the woman wanted. Yet the difficulties are many. You cannot form any idea of the misery, the superstition, and the slavery that are here. 
you will be in the midst of a mass of half-naked men and women with quaint ideas of caste and isolation. Shunning the white skin through fear or hatred and hated by them intensely. Then the climate is fearfully hot. Our winter in most places being like your summer. In the south, it's always blazing. Then, what happened? Hmm. So, Sister Nibedita is the only woman guided by a guru? No, Swamiji used her as his torchbearer, as the arrow in his bow. And have you ever been to Belur to see Kumari Puja? No, sir. Heard it from my parents. Another revolutionary act of Swamiji. Now, to know the reason and what it stands for, you need to read a little history. Now, from science, you're asking us to read history. Yes. The time. The religious fanatics adhered to their own beliefs and superstitions. Between 1815 and 1818, Sati in Bengal doubled. Raja Ram Mohan Roy vowed to oppose Sati after his sister-in-law died by jumping into the pyre of his brother, Jagmohan, in 1811. Now, William Carey and reformers like Ram Mohan Roy forced the British Governor General, Lord Bentick, to ban Sati. Oh, horrible, sir. Burning alive Hindu widows. Yes. But our attitude had to be changed, changed with an example. We have many women gods, yet women were not given the pride of place. Even today, there is disparity. Rubbish. You have equal opportunities. And Swamiji wanted to plant an example that would influence the mass. He initiated Kumari Puja at Belodmat in 1899. His guru, Sri Ramakrishna Padmahansa, believed that little girls were manifestations of the Divine Mother. An incarnation of, of Shakti is the most pious and popular form of mother worship. Now in Bengal, elderly people address young girls as Ma out of affection. Durga is Uma. She returns home to her parents every year. Thakur said to look upon God as mother is the purest and the highest form of sadhana. But that did not stop, did it? I'll come to that later. But see this first. You must also learn from every corner, every incident that, that happened to him. Here we go. Roll Sienna Victor, Juliet 64861. Vivekananda learned many lessons from ordinary people. One evening at Khetri, on 10th May 1893, the Raja had arranged an evening of entertainment when a young Notch girl, as they were called in the 19th century India, began her recital. The monk stayed in his room. Deeply hurt, the lady began to sing a song by the famous blind poet-singer Surdas of Mathura, who lived between 1483 and 1563. <laughs> As if addressed to this young monk, it appeared as a philosophical reproach against the arrogance of virtue. Even God does not make a distinction between a sinner and a saint. Why do you? Do not look at my evil qualities, Lord, but at the purity of my heart. Hardly had she sung the first notes of the song with pain in her heart. Then the sannyasin came down and sat in an attitude of respect. The look of hurt in the girl's eyes on being despised and insulted haunted the young monk for many years. She led him to serious self-reflection. Sir, 
what was Sister Nivedita doing? <sighs> Nivedita's involvement in nationalist movement increased. She was shadowed by British detectives. Her letters were intercepted. She even used codes. But she was determined to finish the moles who were after her. She even designed a flag with a thunderbolt. Shri Aurobindo wanted that flag to be the national emblem. And Swami Vivekananda allowed her? Well, he had prepared her to meet her adversaries on equal terms. Was Swami Vivekananda a revolutionary? Absolutely. In his own way, he was. Not the revolutionary you think of, but his brother Bhupendranath Dattu was a revolutionary. He held close associations with Sri Aurobindo and Barindra Ghosh. He was arrested by the British police under the charge of sedition and was sentenced to one year's imprisonment in 1907. And Sister Nivedita arranged for his bail. He also became the secretary of the Indian Independence Committee, Berlin, that's right, in 1960, and held the charge till 1918. Sir, and the question, why do great men die young? Now you've got me. I don't have the answer. Perhaps they can feel they've completed their God-assigned work. How old was Swamiji? Just 39 years old. On a July morning of 1902, Nivedita comes to Belumat. Swamiji wishes to feed her. He gives her boiled jackfruit seeds, boiled potatoes, rice and iced milk. After she finished, he washed her hands himself. Nivedita said, what are you doing? I should be serving you instead. <laughs> Swamiji replied, no. Jesus Christ washed his disciples' feet. Nivedita knew the end was near. Fourth of July, in the middle of the night, someone knocked at Nivedita's doors. She opened the door to find a letter from Sharod Anand. Sister left for Belumot. Nivedita requested the Brahmacharis to see. Swamiji lives in our hearts. Sister Nivedita was only planting the seeds that would one day bloom. She was following Swamiji. There is no need for any set programs for upliftment of women. Give them education and leave them free. They will work out the solution of their own problems themselves. Now think, you'll understand why I am here searching for him. the world 